Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And today we're going to be talking about premature menopause. I'm joined by Dr. Etka Kapoor, who is a board certified endocrinologist and menopause specialist and an associate director of Mayo Clinic Center for Women's Health. She's also an associate professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro, for having me, or it's an honor. So firstly, for our practitioners, can you make the differentiation between what may be an early menopause as opposed to what truly is considered premature? And there really is a difference, I would think, between the two. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the most important question here, I guess. So um, as this audience probably knows, Dr. Shapiro, the average age of menopause in our continent is uh, 52 years. So if a woman goes through menopause for any reason due to loss of follicular activity prior to the age of 40 years, that qualifies as premature menopause. And if that loss of follicular activity happens between the ages of 40 to 45, that is early menopause. Okay, so what's the significance of having a premature menopause being that early? Mm -hmm. So one is the obvious, the loss of fertility, because if a woman loses her uh, the pool of the uh, ovarian follicles, she becomes infertile or subfertile. But the other thing is the premature loss of female reproductive hormones, predominantly estrogen. And while we automatically think of symptoms that go along with estrogen deficiency, the bigger issue really here is the long-term impact of that premature estrogen deprivation. So these women have a higher risk of coronary artery disease, osteoporosis, cognitive decline, and even early mortality. So significant long-term price to pay for this early follicular loss. So what are some of the common causes that lead to premature menopause? So, you know, I like to think of it as two broad categories. So one would be the spontaneous causes. So we have causes like uh, genetically mediated uh, ovarian insufficiency or autoimmunity mediated. And then is the big bucket idiopathic. So most of the cases with premature ovarian insufficiency are thought to be idiopathic. But truly speaking, many of these are perhaps unidentified genetic mutations that we just don't know about. Then the More important to come. More to come, definitely. Yeah. The iatrogenic causes tend to be the most common ones, sort of where we know what the etiology is. And those could be because of surgeries, the obvious ones being complete removal of the ovaries, but even surgeries like ovarian cystectomy, so where we are removing, excuse me, an ovarian cyst or mm -hmm. a hysterectomy or uterine artery embolization could potentially lead to ovarian insufficiency. Then uh, radiation as commonly occurs as part of cancer treatment and chemotherapy use can also shut the ovaries down. So many of these women will present to primary care. What are some of the things that we should be looking for in terms of their presentation that should make us think about this? That's, that's a million dollar question. So, you know, obviously if the ovaries are uh, being taken out or somebody receives chemotherapy that is known to be gonadotoxic, then the diagnosis is more obvious. Right. But in a lo lot of these uh, spontaneous cases, these women have such nonspecific symptoms and they've had them for months and years even before a diagnosis is made. And it's often said that these patients unfortunately have been to multiple providers before mm -hmm. they can arrive at a diagnosis. And part of the issue there is that the symptoms can be intermittent, they can be nonspecific, which leads to diagnostic delays. But in terms of what to expect, they present with uh, secondary amenorrhea, sometimes primary amenorrhea, and then menstrual irregularities, infertility or subfertility. Then they can have symptoms of uh, estrogen deprivation, which again, like I was telling you, could be intermittent. But then again, the classic symptoms being um, hot flashes, night sweats, mood problems, sleep difficulties. A lot of times these symptoms tend to be more pronounced in these younger women in comparison to women who go through natural menopause. The other aspect that I want to highlight is that, you know, we know that we can expect some mood related changes in women who go through natural menopause. But these women who go through premature menopause tend to have a disproportionate psychological burden of symptoms or uh, the psychological component of symptoms rather uh, and that is in part or in large part driven by infertility or subfertility in these patients. So that's something we have to be mindful of that a significant mm -hmm. component of the psychological symptoms. That's what they typically present with. So when they do present, 
Um, is there an algorithm or at least a, a basic protocol of what we should be considering in terms of investigation? Absolutely. Great question. So like, you know, when they come into us with secondary amenorrhea, then the typical workup starts off with the workup of secondary amenorrhea itself. So a serum pregnancy test, assessment of thyroid function, prolactin, and an FSH level. Now, estrogen levels, you know, a lot of providers check them, but they're not very informative, particularly in the early stages of the disease, because they can be all over the map. And in right. fact, high. So they are not very informative. Now, if that initial FSH is elevated uh, more than 40 international units per liter, that's a pointer towards premature ovarian insufficiency. But then again, we never go by a single test. So we typically repeat it four to six weeks later. And if it is still elevated in that range, then a diagnosis of POI can be made. Now, I should say that some societies do use lower thresholds, lower diagnostic cutoffs of FSH mm -hmm. as low as 30 and 25. But for our purposes, 40 is a good number to go by. And if you have two uh, measurements like this, is there any chance that there can be a return back to spontaneous ovulation? You know, how do we cancel these women in terms of pregnancy risk? That's a, that's a very, very important question for the clinical practice because yeah, that's known to occur. So a lot of these women will go through cycles where they will spontaneously ovulate and can even get pregnant. And that happens in up to 10% of women with spontaneous uh -huh. POI. So that has to be kept in mind. In fact, that's a very important counseling point when you're discussing management options and hormone therapy. If a woman is not desirous of more children, then she has to have some form of contraception on board. It may sound ironic, but that's the fact of the matter. Well, yeah, because, because of that concern. So then let's move on to management recommendation for these women. Um, you know, the concern is that they are premature. We don't want to leave them without estrogen because of the fact that the prematurity, all those things that you mentioned in terms of cardiovascular health, dementia, and so on. So how do you approach this? Yeah, again, a very loaded question. So mm -hmm. as uh, we have discussed that because premature menopause impacts so many aspects of a woman's health, Dr. Shapiro, the management also has to be multifaceted and multidisciplinary. So, you know, the overall big goals of treatment really are uh, improvement in symptoms, so symptom control, psychological support. That's, that's very important for these women for the reasons that we discussed earlier hormone replacement, and mitigation of the long-term risk associated with estrogen deprivation. So those are the big categories in which I think about it. So just going through these one by one. So first of all, the psychological support at you know, first consultation and subsequent visits, I try to carve out enough time to spend with these patients and answer as many questions as they have and as they have and you know, offer support, make them aware about support groups, et cetera. If the patient is desirous of fertility, then that's a very complicated discussion also. So referral to a reproductive endocrinologist is warranted at that point in time. Then in terms of symptom control and hormone therapy, so estrogen therapy is sort of the most effective treatment for management of symptoms in these patients. But the, the, the point that I try to impress to the patients and to the providers also when that I'm talking to them is that hormone therapy use in these patients has to be viewed very differently from how we look at it uh, for women after natural menopause. So, you know, mm -hmm. this mistake is made too often. And that's one thing I try to correct a lot is that, you know, the risks and benefits of hormone therapy use in women after natural menopause do not apply to the special population. Right. Here, the goal truly is hormone replacement because we are trying to reinstate the hormonal milieu to what it should be for a woman in that age group. So and the sad part is that we do not have too many randomized control trials out there or consensus guidelines that can guide us in this regard. But most experts agree that unless there's a contraindication, these women should be treated with replacement doses of hormone therapy, at least until the natural age of menopause potentially longer, depending upon the risk-benefit balance. So I view premature menopause as an endocrine deficiency state rather than just right. menopause that happens earlier. Well, this is so important. And I think it's so important for us to be aware of the fact that we can't group these women as just being menopausal, that each in this case truly matters. Thank exactly. you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you.